Amen. So the title of this morning's sermon is Marriage is Temporary. Marriage is Temporary. Now, don't get, don't get concerned with a title like that, okay? I'm not saying that, you know, I'm going to get up here and start condoning divorce or anything like that. But, uh, you know, we, we still believe that, you know, uh, a man and a woman, once they're, once they're married, are to be, you know, it's till death do us part, okay? So it's not that kind of a sermon. But marriage is temporary in the sense of it's temporary in light of eternity. You know, I want to just talk a little bit about marriage, what it is, what it isn't, and kind of debunk some false teaching around, uh, around this topic of marriage that's out there today. But marriage is temporary. It's not something that we're going to experience throughout all of eternity. You know, the, you know and I, I could just see like a, a collective sigh throughout the room, right? I was, whew, you know, you're all worried about that. I'm kidding. But, you know, that is something that is a relationship that is, is going to come to an end. You know, it is until death do us part. You know, and when death parts us, that's it. Marriage is over. But marriage, uh, you know, to start out, of course, we understand it. But it seems like even in this day and age, especially, we have to even go so far as to define what marriage is. You don't even want to bring up the topic of marriage without at least taking a minute to explain what it even is. And it means just start out by saying that marriage is the union of one man and one woman for life. Right. One man and one woman, okay? It's not two dudes. It's not two chicks. It's not multiple people. It's one man and one woman. Biblically speaking, you know, whatever the standard the world wants to form, whatever definition of marriage they want to make up, you know, you know, good luck with that. They're, they're up so backwards they can't even figure out what bathroom to use anymore. Right. But we understand here, because we have the Word of God to guide us, that marriage is something as between one man and one woman. If you look there in Genesis chapter 2, it's one of the first things the Bible uh, talks about. In verse 18, it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast out of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found and help meat for him. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took out one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman, because she was taken out of a man. Verse 24 Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. So what we have here is one man cleaving unto one woman. And if you would, go over to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. So we see, first of all, that you know, it's between a man and a woman. You know, one of each. That's what makes up a marriage today. And you know, that seems pretty you know, elementary, but again, the world is confused on the subject. Uh, another thing I'll just touch on here real quick. Uh, you know, I've talked about this in the past, even in this last year, I've preached a whole sermon on this. We'll touch on it again tonight. But uh, polygamy is not condoned in Scripture. You know, I know there's a lot of new folks in here that are new to Bible reading. You're going to come, if you're reading your Bible faithfully, you're going to come across passages in the Old Testament where, it's, where you, if you didn't understand, you might sound like maybe God is okay with polygamy. Well, He's not. You know, I don't want to get up into this morning's or this evening's sermon too much, but sometimes God just, you know, makes allowances for what man is already going to do despite uh, what God commands. So he, he makes allowances. But make no mistake about it, God's perfect will is that it's one man and one woman. He does not condone polygamy. Okay? Look at Deuteronomy, or you're in Mark chapter 10 there. It says in verse 8, And they twain shall be one flesh. So they are no more twain, but one flesh. Now twain is two. Okay? Not, not tres, not cuatro, not cinco, right? That's as high as I can get. But, you know, <laughs> that, you know twain, meaning two, only two people are going to be one flesh. Not me and my wife and another woman and another woman, and I'm going to have multiple wives. You know, it's not going to be us four or one flesh. It's going to be one man and one woman are going to be one flesh. The twain shall be one flesh. So polygamy is not condoned in Scripture. Uh, in fact, in Deuteronomy 17, if you recall, just a few weeks ago, we preached, but we went through that chapter, and there was a commandment given to the kings that said, Neither shall he multiply wives, that his heart turn not away, neither shall he great multi greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. So God is saying, look, he's forbidding kings in the Old Testament to say they're not going to have a multitude of wives. It's forbidden. And why? You know, we'll say, well, that's for the king. Yeah, but the king is an example, Right? People follow their examples, and it was important to God that the man that was lifted up, the man that uh, the whole nation was going to be looking to, set the right example. 
And that's why he said, look, don't have a multitude of wives. Because what the king does, a lot of times people just they say, oh, this must be okay. And we understand that. Now, God does, did, does give, in the Old Testament, he gives clauses, right, to allow for the fact that polygamy is going to happen despite of his disapproval. And that's where people get confused because you read verses like Exodus 21, 10, which says, if he take him another wife, her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage shall, not, shall he not diminish. So he's saying, look, if a man has a wife and he marries another, the first wife is not going to be despised. He's still going to perform the duties of marriage under her. Her food, her raiment are still going to be given under her. He can't just treat her, you know, like, like the old model and just, you know, I'm just going to let it go sit out in the yard and, and, and rust. He's still got to take care of her and provide for her, okay? So that's, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that because, again, I've, I've preached whole sermons on that. But what I want to preach about uh, this morning is the fact that marriage is a special relationship because of the fact that it is temporary. And that's not to say, again, as I started out, that marriage is not a permanent union because it is. If you're there in Mark, did you stay in Mark? If you haven't, you can just listen along. But in Mark chapter, nine, or chapter 10, verse 9, we see that marriage is a permanent union on earth. You know, while we are living this life, you know, marriages are not something we should just be in and out of during our life. You know, the God's perfect will is that one man marries one woman and they stay together for life. And again, I know there's folks that have divorced in the room, you know, and I'm not trying to pick on anybody this, this, this morning. That's never my intent is to hurt people's feelings. But, you know, there's a lot of folks in this room that have not, uh, have not uh, gotten divorced. There's a lot of folks that haven't gotten married. And they need to understand these things out of the Word of God. And there's a lot of folks in here that have already gotten divorced that would say, hey, if I'd known that, I would have made a more effort to stay married. You know, so let me just, uh, you know, educate the others in the room that have not made that mistake so that they can, they can go into marriage understanding what's required of them. The Bible says in verse 9, What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. He's saying, look, when you, get, when you take your vows before God and you swear to give yourself unto this person in sickness and in health and poverty and wealth and forsaking all others, you know, that is a vow before God that God has brought you together and you are supposed to keep that until death do you part. He says, let not man put asunder. Don't call the $200 divorce lawyer. Don't go to the judge and get the no-fault divorce. Don't let man put that asunder. <laughs> he says, and in, the, and in his house, uh, his, I, his disciples asked him again of the same matter, and he saith unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife, that's divorce, that's what that means, to put away your wife. Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And then so he's saying, look, if a man puts away his wife and marries another woman, that's adultery against her. That's what God calls it. And then he flips it and he says, And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. You know, and that's not something I want to spend a lot of time on. But what I do want us to understand is that marriage is a permanent union here on earth. And it's a very special one, but it's also temporary when we look at it in the whole of eternity. It's not something that's going to last throughout all of eternity. Now, there's probably mo nobody in this room, I don't know if anybody in this room maybe th had that impression that somehow they're going to get to heaven and you're still going to be stuck with them, right? <laughs> Just kidding. You know, you're, 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 you're thinking, oh man, great, we're in this forever, you know? Um, now, I don't think that you're going to, I'm not saying, I don't think you're going to get to heaven and forget who you were married to. You know, although the, Bi the Bible does say you shall wipe away all tears, so maybe, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's what kind of marriage you had. Maybe the Lord will just be like, you don't, you don't want to remember that. <laughs> you know, no, I'm kidding. But, you know, I think you will still know your spouse in heaven. But there just, obviously, there won't be that relationship. There's no need for that relationship in heaven. But there is, you know, most everyone in this room probably understands that or gets that, you know. But there is an entire group of people out there that have a complete false doctrine built around the fact that they think that marriage is somehow going to go on forever in eternity. And that women are, just, that heaven to them is women just perpetually giving birth forever. That's not heaven, ladies. <laughs> you know, you probably don't have to, you know, I probably have to explain that to you, right? That's, that's not, that's their idea of heaven. It's just you up there just giving birth forever and married to the same guy. You know, <laughs> that's not, that's not something that you want for yourself. But who, I, who are these people? The Mormons. The Mormons teach this doctrine of celestial marriage. Who's ever heard of this? Celestial marriage. And this is something that they, they, they teach in their doctrines. And I want to kind of just look at what they teach here for a minute. So, <coughs> to, the, to the Mormon, the marriage relationship uh, will, will continue on in heaven. And, you know, but what we understand from the scripture is that it will not. Is that it is temporary. And that, that is contrary to Mormon doctrine, what the Bible actually teaches. 
So celestial marriage, according to the Mormons, also called the new and everlasting covenant of marriage, eternal marriage, temple marriage, or the principle. So they've got all these different doc names for the same doctrine to try to keep it as confusing as they can. You know, you, you, you talk to these people and you try to get to the bottom of things and it's just this big, you know, web of, of just deceit and terms. He says that celestial marriage is a doctrine that marriage can last forever in heaven. It says that it can, okay? Not that it will. So not every Mormon thinks that they're going to be, that they're going to experience eternal marriage with their spouse. The, and uh, what, what they get into here a little bit in a minute is the fact that this is something that's only given to certain people having a sealed marriage in the temple. You know, the, the Mormon church, you know, and I called a Mormon church. I called three because the first two, their numbers didn't even work off of Google. You know, if I taught some of the things they taught, I would probably try to make it hard to get a hold of me too. But I finally got a hold of a secretary, nice lady, you know, as all Mormons usually are, very polite. And she was able to, she said, I said, hey, I have a question about your, your some doctrine about marriage. And she said, well, I'm not really authorized to, to answer those questions. I said, well, Tell me what your question is, and, and I'll see if that's something I can I can take care of. And I just asked her, you know, hey, who can get married uh, in the church? Do all Mormons have to get married in the temple? And because it used to be that they that they did that civil unions were not recognized by the Mormon Church, but they've just recently changed that. So this doctrine of celestial marriage only applies to Mormons that seek what's called a sealed marriage within the temple. So if you're a Mormon and you go down to the courthouse and get married, the church will say, oh yeah, you're married. You know, the church will recognize that. You know, as of late, that's a, a recent development. Okay, that wasn't always the, that way in their church. But they'll say, but you know, the celestial marriage is not for you. That's something you actually have to go into the temple and you have to, uh, we'll read it here in a minute. There's all these things that have to uh, go on before you can get there. But it says here that this celestial marriage is a doctrine that marriage can last forever in heaven. This is a unique teaching of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This is an article from Wikipedia. And you know, anytime you have a unique teaching that's unique to your church, you might want to step back and say, am I in a cult? You might want to step back and say, is this even right? Because every, every, every cult has some weird, strange teaching. And look, and you can take the Bible, and you can pull things out of context, and you can make up all kinds of weird doctrines, as long as you take that one passage out of, you know, that's why they get baptized for the dead, you know, because of, because of what they read in the Bible. And, you know, they're going to take some, they're gonna take some uh, 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 scripture out of context here as well in order to promote this false doctrine of celestial marriage. So beware of unique teachings. You know, that cult charge is something that sometimes we have leveled against us at Faithful Word. You guys are a cult. Okay, what's our unique teaching? What's the teaching that only we teach? There isn't one. The, uh, the, the, the post-trib rapture, millions of people believe that. The reprobate doctrine, millions of people Generate that it, for generations before we even right. came into existence, I believe that. There is no one unique teaching here at Faithful Word Baptist Church. You know, but there is a lot of biblical teaching. And that's, that's the thing. No matter what you know, name you want to put on the door, you have to let the Bible be your final authority and let everything else line up with that. So this unique teaching of celestial marriage is an ordinance, again, this is from the article, associated with a covenant that takes place inside temples by those authorized to hold the sealing power okay this is why people get into this stuff because it's just all the secret people love secret you know special club stuff you know they want to know the handshake they want to you know what's the secret password to get in you know people are into that because it makes them feel important and exclusive to others you know <coughs> and uh, so they have you can only get the celestial marriage in the temple and it has to be a ceremony conducted by those who are authorized to hold the sealing power so not everybody can conduct this marriage the only people allowed to enter the temple, be married there, or attend these weddings are those who hold an official temple recommend. So if you have a good Mormon friend and you're not Mormon and he's getting married in this temple, going through this process, you're not invited. You know, you can't go because you don't have the temple recommend. Okay? Obtaining it, say, well, I want to go. You know, I want to be, I want to uh, uh, celebrate this joyous day, right? Well, obtaining a temple recommend requires one to abide by LDS church doctrine and be interviewed and considered worthy by their bishop and stake president. So there's this whole internship process or an interview uh, process that you have to go through. You got to talk to the bishop, this other guy, the stake president, whatever that is, you know, and you have to be deemed worthy to even go there, even if it's not your wedding. And especially if you want to get 
you know, have a sealed marriage, you have to be allowed this access. You know, they're going to sit you down and ask you some questions. I don't know what goes on in that interview. I'm sure they grill you about all their, their strange teachings. But uh, they want to make sure you're, you know, you're not just, you're, fake, you're not faking it, that you, you've been fully persuaded that the Mormon church is right. So a prerequisite to contracting a celestial marriage, in addition to obtaining a temple recommend, involves undergoing the temple endowment. Now, these are whole things that I, I don't even have time to go into, and I'm not even sure I want it. This involves making of certain covenants with God. So before you can make that you know, covenant with your spouse before God, you've got to figure out all these other covenants before God and, and keep all this doctrine and be interviewed and get in there also that you can have your marriage sealed for eternity. In particular, one is expected to promise to be obedient to all the Lord's commandments, including living a clean, chaste life. Good luck with that. That's one vow I'm not going to make. I mean, that's something I'm a purpose in my heart to do, but I'm not going get to get up there and say, I am going to obey all the Lord's commandments from here on out. I'm going to obey every last one. I'm never going to break another commandment again. You know, you're setting yourself up you know, for a, for a fall. There's nobody can do that. I mean, you can try, and we understand we want to live by the commandments. You know, we want to do those things. We want to love our neighbors, ourselves, and so on and so forth. But to sit there and to say, I'm going to keep all the Lord's commandments, folks, it's just not even possible. Okay. Including living a clean and chaste life, abstaining from any impure thing, willing to sacrifice and consecrate all that one has for the Lord. So, I mean, you've really got to just be, you know, neck deep in the Mormon church in order to even get uh, uh, in, into this, this marriage ceremony. In the celestial marriage ceremony, a man and a woman make covenants to God and to each other and are said to be sealed as a husband and wife for time and all eternity. Right? I mean, it's, it's just, they're going to be, that's it, you're stuck with them. Now, I don't know who would go, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get myself in so much trouble after this, 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 this one here. But, uh, you know, maybe, not, what I mean is, maybe we should do that. I don't know, that's, uh, I would sure like that, <laughs> right? <laughs> get some brownie points up here. But uh, there's so, so you got to go through all this, and then it goes on and says Mormonism. Now you say, where, do they, where are they getting this? Where do they even come up with this stuff? You know, the swearing to keep the commandments, and marriage is going to last forever, and, and we're going to seal ourselves together in the temple, and we're never going to part. You know, it's, it's beyond death do us part. There is no parting. Uh, <coughs> well, they cite some, some passages of Scripture. And if you would, go ahead and turn over to Matthew chapter 16. Okay, These, this is where they get it. Because again, every unique teaching, you know, in so-called churches, they're going to take a passage of Scripture and twist it, or misinterpret it, or not preach it in the context, or compare spiritual things with spiritual things. They're not going to read a certain passage of Scripture and then make sure it's lining up with the Bible as a whole. They like to pull things out and just focus on that one verse, one part of a verse, and teach their false doctrine. So we see, first of all, in Matthew chapter 16, it says there in verse 17, uh, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Borjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the, the keys of, kingdom, uh, the, of the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever sh thou shalt bind upon earth, bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So it's saying, see right there. If we bind, we're the church. If we bind this on, on earth, it's going to be bound in heaven. And there he, say, he says, whatsoever. But here's the thing that w this is this passage deals with a very. He's talking about a very specific thing that the church has authority over, and it's church discipline. It's not talking about marriage. He's talking about the fact that whatever we bind here on earth regarding church discipline uh, is what is going to be bound. That God's going to honor that from heaven. You know, uh, that, and that authority is, is clarified in 1 Corinthians 5. You know, the church only has so much authority as to who it is allowed in and out of here. You know, there are, there, you know, certain, if you get into certain sins, it's the boot, you know, and so that you'll go out and get it right and come back. But we do not have the authority to say, Lord, these pe this married couple is going to go to heaven and that's the way they're going to be from now on. Even though in spite of some other you know, passages in, in Scripture that clearly teach that, and we'll get here in a minute, but that there is neither giving a marriage, or they're neither married nor given a marriage in heaven. So what this is talking about in Matthew chapter 16 is the fact that the church has authority to discipline its members if they get into certain sins. 
And by the way, those sins are limited to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Okay? And if you were curious what those are, go read 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Okay? That's what it's limited to. And as well as Matthew 18. Go ahead and turn over to Matthew chapter 18. <clears throat> and this kind of expands on this idea that, hey, you know, what's bound in heaven or bound on earth is bound in heaven. It's referring to church authority when it comes to the subject of church discipline, not marriage as they're misapplying it. It says in Matthew 18, verse 15, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take thee uh, one, or two, one or two more, and the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. If he, but if he neglect to hear the church, let him be as a heathen man and as a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth, shall be loosed in heaven. So that's what he's talking about when he's talking about binding on earth and, and binding in heaven and loosing on earth and loosing heaven is with regards to church discipline. Because this is another thing that will get you kicked out of church, not just 1 Corinthians 5. If there's an offense between brethren, and I'm not just talking about, you know, they looked at me funny. I'm saying if there's like, you know, we're not to go to law with our brethren. You know, if, if, if we go out there and somebody backs into somebody else's car, and puts a huge dent in it and then squeals out of the parking lot. We all watch you drive out and you're saying, no, it wasn't me. And you're trying to get an insurance claim. You know, that kind of a thing. We're supposed to settle that in-house. Like, no, we saw you, you know. First, the guy you hit, he would go to you and say, hey, man, let's make this right. No, no, I know what you're talking about. Then he's going to grab two or three witnesses and say, hey, he's not making it right. And if he still doesn't want to do it, then the church says, hey, you either need to make that right or get out. You know, now you're going to be as a heathen or a Republican unto us. So that's what it's talking about. And, but notice how he ends it there. When he's talking about this, you know, making things right with your brother, you know, if there's not going to hear you, bring some witnesses, go to the church, this process that you go through. But what is, how does he close that passage? Verse 18. What you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. What you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. These aren't two separate teachings. Jesus isn't just teaching, you know, verses 15 through seven, uh, 17 and then just jumping over to something completely different. There, it's, it's in context. So now you can see in context what he's referring to when he says whatsoever is bound on earth is bound in heaven and it's not marriage it's not celestial marriage it's not us binding two people together for all eternity that might be a form of church discipline i don't know <laughs> uh, there i go again <laughs> anyway uh so we're going to continue on in the article but now you understand that you know there's one passage that they take and twist to preach this false doctrine and it doesn't jive it doesn't come together it doesn't work it's wrong this uh, article goes on and it says, in the LDS church today, both men and women may enter a celestial marriage with only one living partner at a time. That's kind of surprising for the LDS church. You know, they were big proponents of, of uh, so we don't do that anymore. No, only the real hardcore Mormons do it. Only the ones that actually follow the teachings of their found founders actually practice polygamy. All these non-polygamist, you know, Mormons are the watered down version. Just keep that in mind. A man may be sealed to more than one woman. If his wife dies, he may enter into another celestial marriage and be sealed to both his living wife and deceived wife or wives. Many Mormons will believe that all these marriages will be valid in the eternities. And the husband will live together in the celestial kingdom as a family with all whom he was sealed. So they're, you know, they're still trying to get that polygamy in one way or another. You know, hey, maybe you can't have a multitude of wives here, but if she kicks the bucket, you can, you can have a few more up there, you know. You can practice polygamy in heaven. That's what it's teaching here. <laughs> so again, but this, this is wrong. Okay, and You're saying, look, they're gonna, these marriages will be valid forever, for all the eternities, right? That he's going to live together forever in a celestial kingdom with all of these, these people that he's married. But, and they, and they, they turn to uh, uh, Matthew chapter 22. Go over to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. And this is what they cite. They turn to this passage and cite this as proof for this doctrine. <coughs> we'll be, now, they don't start in verse 23. You know, they start a little bit later, but we're going we're gonna to back up. You know, that's a good thing to do. And if you run into a, 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 a scripture you don't understand, or it's not making sense, or somebody's trying to teach you some false doctrine, sometimes it's good to just read the passages around that, 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 uh, that scripture. Yep. You know, go to the chapter before. You know, go to the chapter after. You know, sometimes the answer to your question is on the next page or the next chapter or the next book. You know, and that's another principle not to get hung up in your Bible reading. When you run into something you don't understand, don't just park it there and try and figure it out. Just keep reading. You'll understand it the next time. The answer just might be on the next page. 
So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to back up a little bit from where they start in, in verse 23 and say, where the Bible says, excuse me, the same day came to him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, also the, sec uh, the second also, excuse me, and the third unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. So they think they've really got Jesus here. They're like, ha-ha, if there's a resurrection, you know, who is she going to be married to in heaven, right? And of course, we know the answer in verse 29. And this is where they like to pick it up. And he answered, in, or they start in verse 30, but it says, And Jesus answered and said to them, He do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry, nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of heaven. Okay? Now, the way they interpret that is, is this. They say, they, refer, they know that this is a, a passage that could pose some problems to their false doctrine. So what they say is that when Jesus is asked about the continuing state of marriage after death, that's the question that the Sadducees, which, by the way, were unsaved people, they don't even believe in the resurrection, right. are posing this question, that when, that, that when they ask that question about continuing marriage, hey, who is she going to be married to in heaven, right? This question of, of marriage continuing on in heaven, uh, he said, they, 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 the, the Jesus says, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Mormons do not interpret Jesus' statement as meaning that marriages will not exist after the resurrection, but that marriages will not be performed after the resurrection. For all questions of marital sat uh, status must be settled before that time. That's what they teach. So he's not saying, oh, look, there's not going to be marriage in heaven. It's just that after, once we get to heaven, nobody's getting married anymore. And everybody that already is married, you know, the, they're going to stay married. So, you know, if you're counting on heaven to get married, you might want to scratch that off the list and, and hurry up and take care of that. But that's what they teach. That's how they interpret that. Now, no spirit-filled believer is going to read that passage and walk away thinking that marriage is continuing in heaven. Yeah, right. I mean, before I even knew about this doctrine, you know, the first time I ever read that, I never put down the Bible and said, wow, once we're married, I'm going to be married forever in heaven. No one's ever thought that. No saved person has read that and thought that. What they walked away from thinking was the, the correct interpretation, which you get when you have the Holy Spirit, when you're actually saved and can understand spiritual things, is that there is no, there is no marriage in heaven. Yeah, that they are not given in marriage in heaven. That they, are, that, that they are as the angels of God in heaven. And angels aren't married. You know, newsflash. They're not, angels aren't. That's, marriage is a unique relationship between a man and a woman on earth, human beings. It's not for the angels in heaven. Because there's no purpose for it. So no spirit believer, spirit filled believer reads Matthew chapter 22 and says, wow, marriages go on forever. But these lost, unsaved people who are, you know, believing in this cult, they just want to teach all these strange things to people. They believe this kind of stuff. And really, when you look at their interpretation, okay, their interpretation of, oh, Jesus is just saying that uh, marriages uh, don't, they, they no longer, uh, we, there is no more getting married in heaven. You know, that they're not performed in heaven. We don't perform them. That's all he's saying is that we don't perform heavens, uh, marriages in heaven. Well, if you take that interpretation of the Mormon church, that means Jesus is avoiding their question. I mean, think it through here. Okay, stay with me and think this through. If, that, if their interpretation is correct, that means Jesus just avoided the question altogether. Hey, Jesus, whose wife is she going to be in heaven? Oh, they don't get married in heaven. That's not, an, that's not an answer. That's a non-answer to the question. <coughs> they say, whose wife shall she be? Inferring that marriage is going to continue in heaven, right? That's what that means. Hey, when she gets to heaven, you know, who is she going to be married to? And he responds by saying, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. And that's what the Mormons interpret as marriages aren't performed in heaven, which is not an answer to the question. Right. Does everyone follow me on that one? That makes sense, right? So Jesus did answer the question, though, didn't he? Yep. He's, not, he's not worried about this. isn't, you know, I don't think he was sweating this one. I don't think he was real worried about it. Like, oh, they caught me, you know. <coughs> Jesus did, not, did answer the question and made it perfectly clear that marriage does not exist in heaven, right? And how did he do that? When he said, they are as the angels of God in heaven, that's him saying, there's no marriage in heaven. Because angels don't marry. 
And angels don't will say, why, how do you know? Because a big part of marriage is procreation. That's part of the, one of the main purposes of marriage, you know, I, you know, to bring it down to that level. And we understand it's a wonderful relationship and there's a lot of great things that go along with it. But part of the reason God instituted marriage is for the continuation of the human race. You know? And angels don't need that. Angels aren't, you know, they're eternal beings. They're not going to die off the scene and have to replace themselves uh, through, through this marriage relationship. He's saying, look, there is the angels of heaven. There's no need to even get married there. That's him answering the question. So their false doctrine, you know, just falls apart when you actually read the, even the, their own verses that they cite to support it. You know, a marriage is a means to replenish the earth. You know, that's another thing we could talk about marriage. Uh, this morning we talked about the fact that, you know, it's temporal uh, in, in the light of eternity, but, you know, it's permanent here on earth, that it's between a man and a woman. And one of the purposes behind marriage is that it would be a fruitful relationship, meaning that children would be born, that it would, it would bring children, uh, uh, the children would be born of that couple. You see, marriage is a means to replenish the earth. <coughs> and if you recall the story, you know, when, when, uh, when they fell in the garden, what does God say to Eve? What was part of the curse? You know, thy, thy, thy conception shall be greatly multiplied in thy sorrow. Right? That was part of it. Hey, you're going you're gonna to give, be giving even more birth than you might have already. Because death has now entered into the world. Right? And death has passed upon all men. So now you're going to have to replace yourselves. And sorry, Eve, that's going to fall on you. And, you know, and I don't know, obviously we don't know what childbirth would have been before the curse and all of that, but it got a lot worse afterwards. You know, he greatly multiplied her sorrow and her conception at that time. <coughs> and man is commanded to be fruitful and to replenish the earth. So uh, that's an another purpose behind marriage, you know, and the, to do your, your God-given responsibility to bear children. You know, I'll never forget, I had, I had a preacher came to our, a guest preacher came to our church you know, back in Michigan, and he, he took me aside and he said, when are you going to fulfill your God-given obligation to fill a pew? You know, he was getting after me about not getting married. I said, yeah, I'm working on it, you know. <laughs> I'm still working on it. But, you know, that is something that we should consider. You know, that the fact that, you know, marriage is for the vast majority of people. That 99% of people are, should get married. And we see a lot of people today that are just, you know, they don't want to get married. They want to put it off. They want to get a dog first. You know, they just want to live together for 10 years and then see if they're compatible. And then maybe she'll get off birth control and then maybe they'll have kids. And they're always along the way just assuming that as soon as they want kids, they're going to be able to have them. But newsflash, you know, a lot of those things that you're taking and putting in your body to prevent childbirth will actually continue on after you decide you want to have kids and make it more difficult for you to even have children. So I think it's, it's a good policy for people to, to marry young and start having kids because that helps them grow up and it helps them, you know, realize that life isn't just fun and games. And that we have a commandment from God to, to be fruitful and to multiply and to replenish the earth. And that's completely contrary to this world's philosophy right now. They're all about, you know, they want to whittle down the human population to like less than half a billion. You know, what was that? Was saying the Georgia Guidestones, those yeah. weird stones that somebody put up in Georgia, they don't know who, reduced the earth's population to less than half a billion. You know, there's like seven billion people on the earth. You know, you first, buddy. Like, who's going? You know, I'm, who's going to sign up for that list? You know, but that's their agenda, you know. You know, you got Greta out there, the little girl with the braids or whatever. What is she from, Switzerland or whatever? I don't, what country is she from? I don't even care. Sweden, yeah, makes sense, right? She's out there, oh, you know, we got to quit having kids. You guys are destroying the environment. You robbed me of my childhood, blah, blah, blah. And she's trying to ri rob kids of their child that haven't been born yet. Saying, don't have kids. You know, get on this philosophy of of depopulating the earth, you know, and, and, and most people today in America, unfortunately, don't even have more than 1.8 kids. And look, I understand that some people, you know, they want more kill children and just can't. You know, I have plenty of, of great friends, godly people that love the Lord, that would love more children, and for whatever reason, God has just deemed for them to have one child. And there's nothing wrong with that, you know. But for a lot of people, God, you know, wants us to have a multitude of children and not have this worldly, worldly philosophy of, of, you know, oh, we got to save the earth. You know, we got we, our carbon footprint. You know, while the rest of us, we're, we're busy just trying to make up what you're lacking. You know, everyone else is having 1.8 kids. I've got four. You know, that's just making up for the other, you know, 0.2 that you didn't have. You know, I'm trying to replace you. 
You know, most people don't even replace themselves anymore in this country. They want to have one or two kids. The best that they can do is just replace themselves at most. But I'm kind of ranting here. But it needs to be ranted about because, you know, the Bible is clear here that we are to have children. That we, and marriage is, a means, is the means by which we are to have them within the bonds of matrimony. That we, you know, man and woman should come together in, 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 in marriage and they should have children and they should raise those kids in a godly household. And it's a command of God to replenish the earth. <clears throat> so we see a lot of things about marriage, what it is and what it isn't this morning. You know, and, and we see that, you know, it's, it's something that's, you know, comes down to just even the, 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 the business of having children. You know, it's, it's a means to that end. That, uh, you know, it's something that's temporary in eternity, but something that's permanent. It's a permanent relationship here on earth. That man should not put asunder that relationship, that it's for life. But one of the probably more endearing things about marriage you know is the fact that it is a means of companionship and i should have had you keep something in genesis 2 if you would turn back there in genesis chapter 2 you know i don't want us to walk away from the sermon this morning just thinking like you know marriage is just some drudgery that you know we have to just perform in this life that god commands us to get married so i guess i have to and you know at least at least he said it's going to be over you know at least i don't have to go into heaven knowing you know, that's not what marriage should be. And, I, you know, we chuckle, but a lot of people have that attitude about marriage. I've known plenty of people, you know, they probably started out young and in love, and they got into it, and as all marriages do, they have their challenges, and they just end up becoming bitter people at one another, angry people, not being able to work out their differences. And they become enemies. And that's, that's unfortunate. That's a shame. Because marriage is supposed to be a source of one of the, you know, you know, our best friend should be our spouse. You know, that's the case in my household. I don't know if she feels that way. <laughs> but I'm sure she does. I'm kidding. But even in Song of Songs, he says, His mouth is most sweet. He is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. So the bride there, the wife, talking about her husband, says, This is my beloved. This is my friend. And what is a friend? A friend's a companion. Some of you share life's experiences with. You know, and that's probably one of the dearest things about marriage is that you get to share life with that individual. That you'll have certain experiences with that person that you'll never have with anybody else. You know, and that's something that, that's not by accident. God deemed it that way. Look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make and help meet for him. You know, God's ideal is not the bachelor life. To just be flying solo. You know, I understand people get themselves into circumstances. That's what they have to live with. That's, you know, and they got to do the best they can with that. And, and God gives grace and mercy. But God's ideal for man and woman is that they be married. And that they have that help meet for him. And that they have that companionship. That the man should not be alone. You know, and, and, and the thing is, we really don't, a lot of guys don't understand that until after they get married. I was talking to one guy who got married recently, and he, had, he said, I didn't realize marriage was this good. And now, granted, he's only a few weeks into it. <laughs> but, you know what I mean? He's going through that honeymoon phase, you know, and he's just like, if I had known how great marriage was, I would have done it so much sooner. That's what he said to me. And I thought about that and I said, you know, there, there's a bit of truth to that, that a lot of times we don't understand why we should be getting married until after after we get married. We get married and the lights come on and we go, oh, yeah, this is great. This is wonderful. And, and uh, you know, I remember I even had that kind of an attitude. And there was a point in my life where I'm working, I probably told the story and I apologize if I have, but where I'm, I'm working for cash, I'm living in a shack in the edge of the woods, you know, with like $400 rent, you know, with no heat <laughs> the first year in winter in northern Michigan. And I had this job working cash part-time at nights. And it dawned on me that if I just stayed single, and continue to live in this literal shack on the edge of a swamp that I could fish every day for the rest of my life. That I could just be a single man, not have any kids, and just go out and fish. And just that would be, you know, I could catch bluegill. I could catch 25 bluegill every day. I'd get a couple walleye. I could hunt. I could just live in the woods and, and just, you know, be an ogre <laughs> or whatever, you know. And just, and, but to some of us, that kind of has an appeal. You know, men, that kind of appeals to us. Like, ah, we'll just be our own man and we'll get off the grid and, and all of that kind of thing. Meanwhile, there's some young lady who wants nothing more than to be somebody's blushing bride, but you're too busy out kissing fishes or something, you know? And, and you know, it, it doesn't make any sense. But after I got married, I look at that life and say, 
What was I thinking? No way. Man, I, I, I love the relationship that I have with my wife and uh, everything that goes along with it. You know, marriage is a very special relationship. And that's really what I wanted to try to drive home this morning. You know, talk a little bit about these weirdos in the Mormon church and their false doctrine. Talk about some of the, just the practicalities of marriage, why we have marriage, what it is. But really, we need to understand something is that marriage is a very unique and fulfilling relationship that should be sought. It should be something that we want in our lives. And if we already are married, it should be something that we're very careful to maintain and not lose and not throw away or take for granted. Because here's the, here's the thing. One day, marriage will pass away forever. That relationship will be gone. We'll still, I believe we'll get to heaven. We'll still know our spouses. We'll still be able to speak with them and reminisce and talk about the times we had on earth. You know, she's probably going to want to break for at least, you know, 30 years or so to say, hey, you know, we've, we've had a good run. I'll get back to you. <laughs> Let me go check some of this stuff out. You know, I've been stuck in a house for a while. You know, I could <laughs> need a little breathing room. You know, who knows? I hope that's not the case, but it probably will be. But, you know, it's something that the point being is that marriage is going to come to an end one day. That relationship is over. And there's no, op you know, sorry, Mormons, there's no other opportunity to experience that in heaven. In fact, heaven really isn't even an option for them unless they get saved, to be honest. <coughs> and we should not take it for granted. The Bible says, I'll just read you from 1 Peter 3, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, speaking of their wives, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hin hindered. You know, the Bible teaches that we are husbands and wives, they are heirs together of the grace of life. And we're both headed, you know, we're both saved, we're both headed to that eternal destination. We're, we have inherited eternal life together. We're sharing, we're, we're experiencing, you know, this Christian life, uh, this, this journey into glory together. You know, raising kids and, 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 and all of that that goes along with it. The husbands and wives are inheriting the same promises. You know, and, and we should cherish that. You know, and, and you know, it's true that marriage is, is, is temporary, but it's permanent here on earth. You know, it's, it's a very temporary relationship, but really that's what makes it all the more unique. You know, there's a lot of relationships. You know, we're always going to have a relationship with God in heaven. You know, we're always going to be somebody's son or daughter or, or uh, father or, or whatever. You know, these, these type of real unique relationships. But marriage is temporary on earth. You know, and that's something that should make it even more unique. The fact that it is temporary. Let's go ahead and pray.